the AI for Good Global Summit convened by ITU recognizes the joint responsibility of governments, the private sector, United Nations agencies, academia and others to ensure AI reaches its full potential while preventing and mitigating harms. And it's a moment that calls for action. And today I'm calling on each of you, each of you to use this summit to help the world to better understand what kinds of regulations, what kinds of guardrails we need to put in place right now. So together, let's make it innovative, let's make it safe, and let's make it responsible for all. Thank you very much. Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anna, for the intro. Hello, everyone. Uh, a very good day to everyone joining us. Welcome to this AI for Good webinar. And today is a webinar finale for our competition. So this is the AI for Fusion Energy Challenge, sure. Multi-Machine Disruption Prediction Challenge. And I'm delighted to, to be joined today by Dr. Christina Rea from MIT, PSFC, and Dr. Sheng, Sheng Wei from HUST. And this webinar, we are going to explore the potential of machine learning in contributing to multi-machine disruption prediction. And as part of the webinar, because it's a finale, we are going to have presentations from the top teams from our challenge that we hosted on Zing. So I'm delighted to see the solutions that we, we, are, we have in stock for you. But at first, I would like to request uh, Matteo Barbarino from IAEA to give some opening remarks. The floor is yours, Matteo. Thank you, Thomas. Hi, I'm Matteo Barbarino. I'm a fusion scientist working at the International Atomic Energy Agency. Today, you will hear about fusion energy. Fusion holds the promise of abundant, safe, and carbon-free energy. It is the process that powers the stars, and the, by this process, two light particles combine to form a heavier single one while releasing energy. Uh, this process occurs within a plasma, which is a state of matter consisting of ions and free electrons. And although fusion energy is not commercially, commercially viable yet, we are working, collaborating worldwide to make this a reality. One method to achieve fusion involves the use of magnets within a, a, a device of machine called tokamak. However, instabilities can arise within this machine, within, within the tokamak, and these instabilities lead to energy losses and termination of the whole of the fusion process. These phenomena are called disruptions. So it is really important that disruptions are detected and predicted as early as possible. Artificial intelligence can aid the development of methods for disruption prediction, and preliminary research in this area has already yielded promising results. So within the IAEA, Coordinated Research Project on AI for Fusion, this challenge aimed to explore the potential of machine learning in contributing to multi-machine disruption prediction. So you will hear about all the details from the three persons behind this challenge to, who really developed it. And these are Dr. Christina Rea from the MIT Plasma Science and Fusion Center, Dr. Zheng Wei from Wangzhou University of Science and Technology, China, and Dr. Zhong Yu Yang from the Southwest, Southwest, Southwestern Institute of Physics, China. So before I give the floor to them, 
Let me also thank a few other people who contributed to the realization of this challenge. And these are Dr. Chinzo Shen from Zhuangzong, Wanzong University of Science and Technology, Dr. Jingxin Zhu from the MIT Plasma Science and Fusion Center, Diakre Guye, who work at the IAEA as an intern over the last uh, year or so. And last but not least, also uh, Thomas Basicolo, who, of course, you know, from the International Telecommunication Union, who's also uh, been a collaborator and a partner on this challenge. So that's all from me, and the floor goes to Dr. Rea. Okay, thank you, Matteo, for the kind introduction. Can you guys uh, see me or see my screen? Maybe not, there is some issue here. Let me just uh, read you. Okay. This seems to be an issue. Yeah, with my camera, it looks like it. Uh, I'll try to reset it right now. It was working up until now. Okay, so before maybe you go on as, as you are trying to reset the camera, I, I can just maybe quick uh, give a quick overview of how the challenge went, and then you give a, 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 a very good background and intro. Yeah, let me let, yeah, let me just reset everything in the meanwhile. Okay. So in that case, I will just give a quick intro on what has happened over the past few months uh, in this competition. So let me share my screen. Okay. So this, uh, this year's competition on AI for Fusion Energy Challenge uh, was titled Mat Machine Disruption Prediction. I will not go into the details, uh, the technical details. Uh, Christina will cover those. Uh, but just an overview, uh, we, we had brainstorming session or curation phase, which we started in around June, May, June. And we launched in end of August, early September on Zindi platform. And a good number of people joined. Uh, the submission was closed exactly one month ago, which was on 12th November. And we did some evaluation. Of course, uh, the host uh, from MIT, uh, HUSD, and other organizations did a good job of evaluating the solutions. And now we are on giving awards, of course, listening to the top solutions and finally giving awards to the winners. And I would like to thank the partners, ITU, IEA, and MIT Plasma Science and Fusion Center, uh, HUST and JTEXT, Southwest Institute of Physics, SIP, as well as uh, Zindi, which was the competition platform. Uh, they did an amazing job to bring a platform for us to host this competition. And in terms of the numbers, just a quick highlights. Uh, 361 people enrolled, and out of these, 51 submitted, gave submissions, and we had a total of 820 submissions. And the geographical representation, we had 54 countries, and you can see the distribution here on some of the top countries that were part of this competition. And today for the prizes and awards, I would like to highlight that the prizes that we are receiving a total of $5,000 US dollars was sponsored by MIT Plasma Science and Fusion Center. So a big thank you to PSFC for hosting this competition, but also sponsoring the prizes that we are awarding today. So in terms of the award, we have the first winner will receive 2,500 USD and the second one, 1,500, third place, 1,000. And of course we will, send a shiny certificate from ITU uh, for the winners of the competition. Next steps, uh, we have started uh, getting all the so solutions on a GitHub page, a dedicated Air for Fusion Energy GitHub repos. So if you improve your solutions, if you have something that you want to share with the community, you can create a repository under the Air for Fusion Energy GitHub. It will be nice to have more work, uh, different type of 
solutions on our GitHub. But also you can publish work, you can join our community, uh, contribute to air for fusion and the advancement of technology, especially use of AI in fusion science research. Okay, so now I will give back um, to Christina for her presentation. I'm, I'm not sure if everything is sorted. I, I don't see her connected yet. So just in just terms talk. of, sorry? Looks like Zoom crashed for Christina. So I have the presentations. I could share it for her if she comes back online. And I don't know if. Uh... Yep. If you have the presentation, yeah, that would be nice. If you can share maybe the first part. Do you have the full percent, the full screen view? Yes. Okay. Um, should I go ahead? Is Christina online? Not yet. Okay. She said she's she's coming back, and I can share the screen with her for her. Okay. Okay, so we wait just a, a few seconds for Christina to join back. Uh, and then we, we can continue with this uh, presentation. Just in, in terms of the presentation outflow. After Christina, we are going to go into the team's uh, presentation. So first, we, we are going to have to start with Jianlu, then Diogo. After Diogo, we have uh, Ning. After Ning, we are going to finish with Chenkwan. I believe that would be the format. OK, um, I think she's coming back in two minutes. I can start, and then she can take it over. OK, OK. Please go ahead. OK, so this is to give an overview about the Fusion Energy Challenge, which, again, was uh, conducted within the IAEA CRP. And the main partners were, of course, IAEA, ITU. But uh, more specifically, the data challenge was uh, managed and developed by the MIT Plasma Science and Fusion Center and the Huangzong University of Science and Technology. Um, Yes, so this already covered this uh, this second slide, and the focus, as I also was uh, hinting to in my opening remarks, is multi-machine disruption prediction. So the, the idea was to focus and develop a multi-machine disruption prediction uh, method. As I said, disruption is an instability that we really want to predict and avoid within a working uh, fusion machine. And ideally, of course, you can imagine if we, we want to have a working fusion power plant, we need to be sure, of course, that the process is always uh, ha is continuously um, happening within, within the machine. And, um, and we want to have it on as much as possible so that you can actually, actually produce enough energy to harness it into electricity. Uh, ITU uh, played also an important role in the uh, organizing the challenge and uh, making sure that we have the platform available and coordinating with Zindi so that the, the, the challenge itself could be advertised and uh, conducted on, on, their, on their platform. Um, so the main, the main framework for how this activity came about, uh, it, it was executed within an IEA coordinated research project. Also short, we call them CRPs. These are international project activities that the IEA facilitates, fosters within a, a group, a network of institutes. Um, three of these institutes particularly uh, participated, three of our, three of the IA partners participated in this activity, and these are the MIT, PSFC, HAST, and ZWIP, together with ITU, of course. We had uh, three tokamaks, so data coming from three, three different machines. These are the Akator C mode, uh, the JTAX tokamak, and the HL2A. So Akator C mode 
belongs to the MIT PSFC. It's a machine which is not no longer operating. JTAX belongs to Wang Zong uh, University and HL2A to SWIP, the Southwestern, Southwestern, Southwestern Institute of Plasma Physics. And this was the time frame. I, I think Christina is back online, so I can uh, give it back to her. Uh, she's also the technical lead for the project, for the IEA project. So I think she's more than well posed to explain the details to you. Christina, are you online? Yes, thanks, Matteo. Can you keep sharing for me? Is that okay? Of course, of course. Apologies, as a technical lead, this is uh, there was a technical failure. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so let me just uh, continue the description. Thanks for taking the lead on sharing the slides. Um, as you also like anticipated, the, the the challenge was really tackling this multi-machine disruption prediction in the, con in th in the context of fusion energy. If you can switch to the next slide. As, as you mentioned before, research in fusion is really trying to tackle transformative technologies, for example, high temperature superconductors in order to provide um, alternative and carbon free electricity generation. We are focusing for this challenge on experiments that are mapped into the magnetic confinement figuration, uh, configurations. Examples are ITER or SPARK under construction in Devons, Massachusetts, where we heat and confine a plasma hydrogen of um, a plasma of hydrogen isotopes via magnetic fields, very strong magnetic fields. We are trying to exactly reproduce the reaction that uh, powers the sun and the stars on Earth by fusing together these uh, light isotopes of, um, of hydrogen and with the consequent release of energy that can be captured and put on the grid. However, the plasma is uh, really plagued by complex nonlinear and multiscale mechanisms that are uh, typically not matched by you know, comprehensive first principle solutions. And disruptions are exactly one of these um, examples where that escape basically the rule of first principle models. They are intended as a sudden loss of plasma confinement. So the magnetic fields can not contain the fuel anymore. So what we need is a predictive solution that allows us to basically um, solve uh, the challenge of disruptions before they occur and stay away from these disruptive boundaries. Uh, we have an abundance of experimental data. There are uh, many. There have, there have been many different oper operational devices in the past 40 years. 30 years. One notable example is, for example, is Jet, who is reaching uh, today. I think uh, is closing operations uh, after 40 years of successful campaigns. Uh, experimental campaigns. And uh, the abundance of experimental data really paves the way to machine learning applications. If you can switch to the next slide, Matteo. Um, when we think about data-driven disruption prediction, this is really crucial to prepare, you know, to get to the technology readiness level that is required for next generation devices. The outstanding question is how can we basically build up on the knowledge that we have right now with, from the data that we have right now in order, in order to ex extrapolate to a model that works on fusion reactors from day one. Uh, I'm borrowing this slide from uh, my colleague Jia Wei, um, where, you know, basically every, every um, in every, day routine for, of experimental devices, disruptions are not necessarily challenging. Uh, we take care of that by just mitigating or just accepting the damage and studying the plasma physics associated to it. Uh, and, but when we scale to next generation devices, this is uh, uh, the energies that are, are associated to this uh, sudden confinement loss that can be released on very fast time scales are really, um, a really uh, a potential concern for the uh, safety of the components of the devices uh, of the device itself. So there is an associated risk, which is not a risk to humans, but is a risk in terms of the cost associated to the device itself and the downtime and maintenance that is associated to the device itself. So we need to be ready to predict disruptions before they occur. Next slide, please, Matteo. So advanced machine learning tools are enabling innovative predictive solutions for fusion problems. And um, uh, the team at MIT, the team at Hust and Sweep have been exploring these uh, fusion problems already related to disruptive data on different devices by also adopting um, techniques such as domain adaptation and transfer learning. And these techniques really allow the black box systems that we can come up with uh, that are part of the machine learning uh, uh, tools to really overcome bias data sets and try to generalize knowledge across different tasks. I'm not gonna go into the detail what domain adaptation is and transfer learning is. I'm just showing for ex an example on the top right, uh, on the bottom right of, you know, uh, on the y-axis you have 
the true positive rate of what we expect as the success rate in predicting disruptions. And on the x-axis, you have the misclassification cost. So how many errors and mistakes you make uh, in order to predict this disruption. And the task here is to predict disruption in a very specific regime on a target device. And um, there have been you know, several numerical experiments and studies. Uh, this is just one of the examples that the, the MIT team has conducted, where we uh, designed some mix and match strategies on the source domain on the training data set in order to really outperform or perform um, uh, pretty well on the, uh, on the target domain. And we verified that there was knowledge transfer in the process. So, the challenge, the data challenge that we instituted with thanks to ITU and IEA really has, is enabling this multi-machine disruption prediction as a test case for domain adaptation, transfer learning techniques on devices that have not been uh, kind of put on the same table before like Alcatraz, Simo, JTEX and HL2A. So this is kind of innovative and new. And uh, I think uh, if it was not mentioned before, just one remark is that really this, uh, this data challenge has enabled us to reach to a broader uh, audience that goes beyond also just the fusion uh, uh, ecosystem. And hopefully it's gonna be just, you know, one of the, uh, of the first steps in this direction. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Christina, for this nice introduction. And of course, Matteo for the big help. Right now, we are going to the team's presentation. So each team has uh, eight minutes to present, to pitch their solution. I'll go with the first team to present. Jian Lu, are you, are you here? Can you share your screen and start the presentation? Yes, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, so make it- Great. And my name is Tian Lu, and my username is Ludian, which is the leaderboard. Can and, you make it full screen? Uh, okay. Yeah. Can, can You're you see sharing the... the presenter screen, not the main screen. So you have to switch the screen. Like this? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, hello everyone, and I'm Ludian, and I'm from China, and uh, before I get started, I have to say that I'm not an expert, and you know, and so the first thing I do to, at the beginning of the computation is to download the data, and just to plot out the signal curves, and just to look at, and oh, yes, in the disruptive signals and the normal signals, it looks different. And uh, I know that I can to sort it with uh, something like a classification or something like that. But when I see the uh, signals from three devices, the features look vastly different, just like this, from a JTEXT or CMOD or, of course, the HL2A. Um, this is a normal shorts and these these are the disruptive shorts. And I don't think I can infer from this, uh, infer this from this. Um, so uh, I'm sorry, I just use the CMOD data to as my training set. So my training set is only two, 20 shorts. Uh, okay. And then as my data training set is very small, and so I just uh, composed a very small network and uh, I use a very aggressive downsampling method. And I can't use a very large network, so I use didn't use a recovery network, it's just a um, convolutional one. And the signals I've chosen to process are listed here, which are all these single channel without the mirror norms coil or the X-ray tomographic uh, sidelines, no. And then I connect, I connect them with um, a connection, a linear layer, which I call it a voting network, it's the same. And this is the structure of my uh, network. So all the signals processed with a small CNNs and then each of the channel rate is a number between zero and one. And then I connected them and got a final rate, which is the criteria 
a criterion for the classification task. And you see a very aggressive uh, downsampling method and a very small network, and it works. And then the methods for my training is very classical, the Adam opt optimizer, the APC lost, and the uh, LR scheduler. And um, I've noticed that the signal lengths are not, uh, not the same. So uh, for most of them, I interpolate them to make them uh, have the same size. And uh, of course, there are very short signals, which is an abnormally. And I will talk, discuss it about later. And I uh, padded them to make them look smooth. And because the training set is um, about 40 milliseconds before disruption, so I chop off the about 60 milliseconds, which is about um, 60 pixels at the end of the training signals. And this is the training curve. Yeah. And in this process, I have noticed that the short signals, it looks like a very important criterion because in the test set, the disruptive shorts, most of them have, a, have some channels that is very short. So, and actually it's a very important criteria and uh, it's very precise. So uh, you didn't say that I can't use it, so I just use it. And, and of course in the network, I also use it uh, intentionally because I just padded them with zero for the very, very short signals. So yes, and uh, uh, then if the signal is shorter than a certain value, which is adjustable and it is directly classified as a dis disruptive one. Yeah, it's very, it's a very simple method and very, very small network. And um, okay, for the for my first try, it is a single channel, and of course it is without padding. And just to look at the different uh, different patterns of the signals and the disruptive looks like um, not very complete it, it's just like look like cut off uh, and it's not um, it looks different from the normal one i use a single channel one to get a score which is about 0 0.73 or 79 it depends on which channel i choose and then in this phase i will i've already made the zero pads for the zero paddings for the uh short signals and i you only use the voting network to connect the, all the channels and I can achieve a F1 score about um, 0 0.9. And <clears throat> with the short uh, signal criterions, which you look like this, if a signal is shorter than a certain value, it's directly classified as disruptive. I use this method and the F1 score can reach even higher which is about 0, 0 0.92. And in this case, the um, true positive rate is about 93% and the false positive rate is about 5%. And this is the ROC curve I've drawn and adjusting the uh, criteria of the um, voting rate and the uh, short signal criteria, which the uh, the cut the threshold for the signal length. And I have to say that this is not really a predictive predictive network. It's just like a classification one. Um, but maybe for a signal, if it's um, uh, have some abnormals very early before it is expected to end and it is very likely to be a disruptive, one, a disruptive one, yeah. So, and you know, the time is very limited for me, so I didn't make very much try and didn't make use of the uh, mag magnetic and the X-ray data. And of course, the uh, 
there are some problems with the data set because the for the test that the um, position of the coils and the entry side, side lines is not provided. If I want to uh, make use of the phase shift of the coils or the uh, tomographic method to reconstruct the uh, two-dimensional. 30 seconds to finish. OK, two-dimensional X-ray emission map. Um, it's not really applicable. So maybe with more time or more information, I can do it just better. OK, uh, that's for my part. OK, thank you so much. Uh, can we have questions from Christina and from Shengwei? Oh, shall I still share my screen? Uh, whichever it's okay. Uh, okay. Shengwei, do you have questions? Or oh, Christina, do you have questions? Um, I just have a comment. I think it's, you know, uh, as uh, not a domain expert, I think you, you really have identified some of the crucial points of the characteristics of the data set. So there is certainly like, you know, uh, a praise that goes in your favor. Um, in terms of question, can, can you uh, re-clarify like the task that you're training uh, the network on? So is this like a classification task? And can you just re-clarify that? Uh, uh, sorry? Uh, you mean rec reclassify my task? If you clarify, if you can clarify the task that the network oh, okay, is trained okay. on, what is the um, lot kind of you know, what are you trying yeah. to minimize for? It's just like um, you input the signal uh, sequences to my network, and I just use um, you know the. If you want to predict or to forecast, you have to use a, something like a recurrent network. And you would have to uh, do it like um, like the on, on situ, in situ way to put in the data and you would just uh, come out a uh, um, result for the network. But for my one, I have to um, input the complete sequence for the uh, complete sequence, and then I just uh, downsample it and use a convolutional one, just like. And your output layer is like a, is a classification? Like yes, your... it's like a classification. OK. So mm -hmm. the question would be, is it the sequence disruptive or non-disruptive? Um, I can tell that it is uh, disruptive or not disruptive, but, but I, can't, I can't do it if the signal is not complete. I have to wait until the whole signal, the collection of the signal is done and can input the whole signal to my network and then I can classify it. If you cut off the signal in the middle of the discharge, it will always output the disruptive one because you know, the disruptive one looks just like cut off in the middle. OK, thanks. Zheng uh, Wei, do you have other questions? Uh, thank you. So uh, the, the best result you, you are getting is by looking at the length of the signal, right? Yeah. So, so that's kind of cheating, right? You know that. <laughs> uh, so the. So do, do you know the right way of doing disruption predictions? So I, I know the, the evaluation method on this platform is, is flawed, so you can use this to, to get good results, but do you know the, the, the correct way of doing it? Yeah, actually, uh, in a realistic one, you, in a realistic uh, situation, you input the signal and you use a recurrent network and, and then maybe you forecast the following 40 seconds of the signal or just to make classification uh, as the every moment of the signal and you get the, it is uh, disruptive or not, or just uh, give a warn and you uh, give a warn rate for uh, the current uh, status of the discharge. And, uh, and Actually, 
it does not mean that you can't use a convolutional network. You can use it before the uh, signal is sent to the recurrent network. And maybe you have a, you see, you'll need more ch channels to uh, do this, not only the single channel level, but also the X-ray tomographic results or the Mironov uh, coils results. Maybe. Okay, I think. okay one, we need to move to the next presentation. Uh, uh, we're yes, running sorry. out of time. So I need to invite Diogo uh, to start sharing the screen and you have eight minutes for your presentation. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, uh, actually, I have worked before in the field and I've done some work in, in disruption prediction, but not with the sort of techniques that I used here. So that's why I included the title here. So what I mainly used was feature extraction and logistic regression. And this I haven't used before. So it's something that I developed uh, just for this uh, competition. So I have just a, one introductory slide. And from this, i uh, just highlight that if we look at future experiments in fusion, the problem that we have is that we won't have any training data to begin with. So if we think um, in terms of large experiments, such as ITER, uh, when the machine starts operating, we don't want any disruption to occur. Uh, but actually, uh, we don't have any training data yet. So it's very important that we look at different machines and we kind of pre-train uh, some kind of uh, model. So in this competition, we had data from three machines. So one of the main uh, things in this approach is to extract features from signals. And here I try to illustrate, uh, well, something that actually the previous speaker was mentioning at the beginning, which is uh, if we look at the signals for non-disruptive, the blue ones, and the signals for disruptive shots, uh, the red ones, uh, sometimes we can immediately identify some features. And what we're seeing here is actually the plasma current and the way it drops when a disruption occurs. Well, for the plasma current, the plasma current is not very useful as a predictor because um, when we see the, the current dropping like this, then the disruption is already uh, occurring. But it may be that in, in for other signals, we may have some uh, markers or features that actually precede the disruption. And we think if we can learn those features, then, then we might be able to predict them. I supposed an experienced physicist, which uh, it wouldn't be me, but an experienced physicist will know uh, which signals would be important and which features to look for in those signals. But if we take the approach of a data scientist, uh, then probably we'll try to develop a machine learning model that learns those features. So in order to have a, a large set of features, uh, we actually use the TSFresh library. And uh, this is a library that can generate hundreds and hundreds of features for, from a time series. I try to divide in certain categories. I won't have time to go into the details. But features can go from very simple things like maximum of a signal to sum of entire values or sum of squares or sum of absolute differences. Uh, we can also check if the signal follows some linear trend like linear regression or how well the signal correlates with its past values like in, in some kind of autocorrelation. Uh, we can look at the number of peaks, uh, crossings, uh, number of values above the mean, things like that. Um, TS Fresh also uh, computes uh, positional statistics, which is the location of uh, the minima and maxima of signals. And sometimes this is important, especially when we are close to the disruption. And of course, uh, we have other things that we should expect to be important, like uh, Fourier transform coefficients and statistics based on the spectrum. So TS Fresh can generate all these kinds of uh, statistics. Then what we need is some kind of model uh, that given the features of a signal, uh, if we know how important each feature is, then we can multiply that importance. I've called it weights. We can multiply the weights of features by, by, the, by those features and then use 
a, a very simple model uh, to check if uh, we have something that uh, goes uh, towards, uh, let's say, pro more probability of disruption or less uh, probability of disruption. Uh, and here, I think it was important to use a very, very simple model. So this is basically a, a linear model, and then on top, a logistic function. I think it was uh, it was quite good to use a, a simple model uh, because since we have many, many features, if we would use a very sophisticated model, it would probably overfit. Um, so how are we going to achieve accurate predictions with such a simple model? Well, the, the approach is to use uh, each signal separately uh, as a separate predictor. Uh, so, uh, we, we have training shots, uh, we have the signals from those shots, and for each type of signal, imagine plasma current, soft X-ray, radiation, locked mode, whatever, for each kind of signal, we train uh, a predictor like this. And then for each test shot, uh, we look at the signals that are present in the test shot, and then we just uh, get the the model that we train for such signal and we make a prediction in the end we average the predictions from those multiple signals or predictors uh, this is actually a quite flexible approach because if we have test test shots with slightly different uh, signals then we use the predictors that correspond to those signals so the model is, is very simple. It's one of these logistic models for each signal. And in principle, we could think that the more signals we have for a test shot, then the better, because the more predictors we have, so we average those predictions and we should get a better result. However, some diagnostics are multi-channel, like soft X-ray, radiation, they have multiple channels. So if we average all those uh, results from those signals or predictors, then some diagnostics are overrepresented. So what's going to happen is that we're going to try to, um, um, to, to, to put away some of the channels that are perhaps not necessary for the prediction. Um, so how do we find which signals we should keep and which signals we should leave aside? And this is where uh, the data from the other two machines come in. Because for those other two machines, uh, we have a larger number of shots. And uh, what, we, what I did here was to divide those shots into 50% for training and 50% for testing or evaluation. So by applying exactly the same approach on these two machines, but because the, the let's say the, the number of test shots is much larger, then we can draw some conclusions of which signals uh, are more useful. Actually, if we look at each individual signal, then I have here some results for how um, accurate uh, those signals uh, could be in terms of disruption predictors. So, so signals from HL to A, they vary from 0 0.8 to 0 0.97. So they're, they're there are a couple of signals that are actually very, very good as disruption predictors and other signals that are good, but not, not as good. And the range is somewhat smaller for JTEXT. So here at this point, there has been a lot of manual work trying to figure out, okay, so I have identified which signals are important for HL2A and JTEXT. Now, how do I find the equivalent signals for CMOD? So here I did my best effort. So it's not guaranteed uh, that, I, that I found the, the best signals, uh, but the signals that I selected uh, for training and prediction on CMOD are the ones listed here. Where you can see that, for example, for soft X-ray from all those 38 channels, I kept only five and I tried to reduce only uh, also the magnetics and the radiation uh, channels to a minimum. Uh, so that they are not overrepresented. So you have here a list. Plasma current is not in this in this list. I ended up not not selecting it. Oh, time is up. Sorry, be quick. Okay, I have here the results for the true positive rate and false positive rate, and I just wanted to mention that 
if we trim the signals to 40 milliseconds before the disruption, the results do not change. And this actually relates to what the previous speaker were, was telling us, that some, uh, in some cases, uh, one of the features that comes, uh, comes up is, is the length of data. So that's why trimming the data is actually not detrimental because the shorter the signal, the more likely it is to be disruptive. Uh, but there are many other features. I try to put a summary here. Uh, for example, for the locked mode, the most important feature is the longest strike above the mean, which occurs very close to the disruption and is a very, very good indicator. So to conclude, I try to generate as many features as possible. I try to use the simplest possible models to avoid overfitting. I trusted the averaging of multiple predictors, and then I tried to improve the results by focusing on a set of the most important signals. How have I identified those important signals? Well, here I try to conduct experiments with the data from the other machines. That's it. Thank you so much. So a quick question from Christina and another question from Shenkwei, so that we keep time. Over to you guys for questions. Thomas, I think we've used already the time for questions, so probably we should move on to next speaker. Okay. Yeah, in the interest of time, I would like to move to the next uh, present presenter. Ning, are you here? Yeah, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the floor is yours. Please, you have eight minutes for your presentation. Yeah, yeah, share screen. Yeah, 10 seconds. Okay. Uh, you can see my screen, right? Yes. Hello? Yeah, okay. Great. Let's get started. So my name is Ning. Uh, I'm from Canada. Uh, I am a principal data scientist from Acerta. Uh, the company is, um, is focusing on research AI and apply AI for the manufacturing industry. Uh, so we have, I have experience with uh, data set from machines and uh, assembly line. Uh, so this experience helped me for this competition, I believe. Uh, so let's get started. So the so overall strategy I want to uh, say is uh, I, I, for this competition, I'm seeking uh, easy solution. So because I consider the sample size, I, I think this is a relatively small, uh, uh, small size. And also, uh, typically, uh, easy solution to generalize well for unseen data, and it's easy to implement, and also quick training and testing. So for my whole solution, just as I put together in a notebook, it can be run within 20 minutes or 30 minutes, depends on your hardware. But that is the whole pipeline from uh, pre-processing, training, and to the final prediction for the test set. Uh, so I'm going to uh, use less input signals, less features, and less hyperprime tunings. That's all I have to do is just try to avoid overfitting. Uh, I think you got the idea. If you're doing more, it's very likely the thing you found is actually seems working, but it's because of the randomness, because you test so much. So that's my overall uh, goal. And so let's jump to my solution. So for the algorithm part, I use a, a tree-based uh, uh, classifier, it's like a GBM. It's just like a multiple trees, or we can think of like a random forest, it's just tree-based. And for the signal, I, I use the, provided the JDDB, the package to read the signal, and also I did pre-processing. It's just basically normalized because uh, 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 the signals across different uh, machines, they have a uh, different range. Okay, so we have to normalize. And uh, for the uh, observation window, so for each uh, sequence, for each example, I just took the last 300 observations. So that's basically like uh, 60 milliseconds. Uh, the sample uh, rate right now, I believe it's 5,000 hertz. So that is a uh, 60 milliseconds observation. Because we have less CMO examples, I believe only 20 in the training set. So, but our goal is to do the prediction on the test set, which they are all uh, CMO 
sample. So I have to tweak the, the sample weight. So I put 15 uh, for the uh, CMOS samples and one for the JTAG samples. So the model will try to learn more or try to punish more if it, it cannot learn the C sample uh, well. Uh, that, that's the model perfect. Next is, uh, yeah, in terms of some uh, signals, I just use 25 simple signals. I use this uh, MRI, uh, MIR uh, signals from one to six, this probe from one to six. For some reason, I cannot find the four for the same mode, so I drop uh, the four. And also, I use the soft uh, X ray, this X. XR signals I use from one to twenty. Uh, I, I I I did explore other signals, but I I feel other signals is some of them like maybe some error count or whatever. They seems like not censored signals, so I feel they may leak the target. So I chose to not using any of them. So just using uh, the twenty five signals, and then I'm going to build features based on the input signals. The way I built the feature engineer also try to keep it simple as possible. So basically just from two uh, perspectives. One is from a frequency domain. So I'm using the spectral entropy. And also from the time domain, I just con uh, using the variance. Uh, so this is a code. This is a key uh, code I do the uh, feature engineer. It's actually pretty easy. So. This one, suppose X is the, the given signals in the observation window. So this is just taking the standard deviation. This is also standard deviation, but there's the rolling window based. Give it a rolling window size, and then this rolling window standard deviation, I take the mean, this take the standard deviation on this rolling standard deviation. Uh, this three is kind of variance, and this is a spectral entropy also, uh, yeah. So that is based on my experience. So for signal processing, typically those those things can catch well. In general, it, it works well for signals, uh, and then you're building uh, features from signals. So this is an example for the spectral entropy. Uh, this example is not from this competition data set. Uh, I this is from an article I wrote for the towards data science. So I just took the picture from that uh, that article. So this is a one signal. You can see it's a vibration signal. And then uh, after we do the FFT uh, transform, you can see this is the new uh, the information in the frequency domain. Uh, basically, the spectral entropy will encode uh, all these distributions of this uh, FFT domain, like the how this spectrum or frequency is, 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 is distributed to a single value. Uh, suppose this signal, the peak at, uh, suppose peak at 100, and then another signal peak at 1000, then and the spectral entropy will be uh, definitely different. So that, that way where we can separate those, those signals, like where is the peak or the, even the second peak or the third peak, they can all, encoded in a single value. This is the spectral entropy. Uh, so that, that for the feature engineering. So basically 25 signals, and then you just uh, time four. So one become uh, four features. So that's, we end up totally like uh, 100 features for the tree-based model. Uh, now in terms of the result, so I train with AUC. AUC is an area and a curve. This metric is good because right now this uh, this this data set is balanced. I treat it like classifier, so the, it's balanced because I believe the failure rate is around the thirty percent to forty percent. So it's kind of balanced. I use this AUC is a good metric. So for five fold cross validation, this is AUC. The average it's ninety seven. It's not bad. And also the true positive rate and the false positive rate. Uh, of course, that depends on the threshold we are using. Uh, we, if we choose different threshold, these two results will be different. And this is the public F1 score and the private F1 score. Uh, for this one, I, I, I don't think F1 score is a good metric, actually. Uh, so I'm thinking, I suggest using uh, average precision of detected events. 
So basically, it's like a, a hybrid precision. So for the detect event, you know, uh, our prediction can be 30 wrong. Seconds, like, 30 seconds to okay. finish. Okay, can be wrong, like two observations early or 20 observations early. So we can give different uh, criteria or tolerance, and then we do the average precision. Uh, so this is actually uh, used by Kaibo competition for detect event. Uh, so I put a detail in my report, so you may uh, reference to to the uh, report, and also I said why the F1 score is not good for this competition. Now you can see uh, this REOV curve for the five folds, and the, uh, so basically you can see rough right there we can get uh, ninety percent the true positive rate and the uh, ten percent the false positive rate. This is a, a precision recall curve. You can get similar idea from here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's all my solution. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, any questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. We're going to skip the Q&A okay. and we yeah. go to the next presenter. Yeah, I hope. And the next presentation sharing, right? is coming from Chen Huang and the team. So uh, you can stop sharing the screen. Uh, Ning? Hello. Uh I think yeah, okay. it's okay. It's pause share. Yeah, you have oh, to oh, stop sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there. Yeah. Okay. It's good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, last but not least, we have Chen Huan. Uh, can you start your presentation, please? Yeah. Can you start sharing screen? Okay. Can you help me? Yes, you can start. You have eight minutes. Um, okay. Hello, everyone. I'm a graduate student from USTC majoring in electronic information and uh, focusing on AI. Mm. There are two people in our team, uh, me, Minlong Wang, and uh, Yu Hang. We are both from Chinese Academy of Science, China. And uh, Now I'm going to show you our approach to this uh, prediction problem. Uh, our subsequent environments are based on the following three assumptions. First, uh, the problem of uh, disruption prediction is regarding as the classification problem of uh, multiple time series. We define each shot into multiple time series windows and uh, predictions about each window to predict whether it uh, will uh, disrupt. We assume that all the signals corresponding to the same mode matching are useful for disruption prediction. We do not uh, do any artificial feature selection. Next, I want to share our approach to processing the data. First of all, because of the name of each signal on the each machine is not not the same, we unified the signal names, and then we found that uh, the that the start times of each various signals for the same shot were were not uh, the same. Which is retarded in the data short should not be being aligned. We, we co corrected the timing of each signal to ensure that they started at the same time and have the same length. Then we downsampling the signal at 5000 under the name value and uh, label the each short, and then dividing the sliding window to for each shot. 
we we use different diffraction methods for the HR2A and the JTAG state data sets respectively respectively because of the difference of series between HI2A and the JTAG. In HI2A we represent the first first 100 time steps for the eruption point as one and the, the other time steps as zero. In the JTAG set we set represent the first 40 time steps for the rupture point as one and the other time steps as two. Finally, we divide divided our sliding window for each shot. As you can see, when we when the window didn't meet meet the 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 early warning area, we set the the step as a random sliding step. For example, zero to twenty. And uh, this is uh, different uh, in HI QA and uh, JTX datasets. And uh, when we when we meet when we meet the early warming area, we set the sliding window to one. Initially, we plan to use multiple models to predict the re we we packaging and uh, finally we in integrated these models, but we found halfway that for most models we failed to achieve a good result. Some were un underfitting and some were not effective. For example, we spent we spent a lot of time and effort to adjusting the random forest model but still failed to obtain a satisfactory result. They are using the LCM plus CN method. We couldn't get it achieve a good result. Then we, then we in limited the same part and uh, then reduce the number of LCM layers to two layers before finally achieving or not bad result. At last, we, we assemble the LSTM two layer of the LSTM models and the GMLP models and get the result. Okay, figure one is is a overview of the GMP architecture with uh, with special gating unit. The model consists of a stack of L labels with identical structure and size. All projection operations are linear, unlike transformers. GMLP do not require positional encodings nor is it necessary to mask out the padding during NIP fine-tuning. Since we did not find the label information for same mode in the leaderboard, we do not know how to calculate the CP and the FAP and the other evaluation questions. So here we just uh, briefly show our various models and the F1 score result of the final ensemble. It can be seen that our ensemble has a certain, impo certain improvement effect. Moreover, we believe that our model can still have some performance improvements but due to time constraints, we do we were not able to complete this part for the turning within the specified time of the competition. Okay, that's all of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation.
I would like to ask Christina and Shenkwe if you have comments or questions to all the presentations that has been done so far before we go to the final announcement. Uh, you you know, you 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 mean you mean who? No, I'm asking the organizers, Christina and Shenkwe. Sorry. Hi. I think I have no comments. Maybe, maybe you can. Maybe Christina, do you have no comments on my side as well? Um. Well, maybe just a clarifying. Um. So Cheng Wang, you're reporting on the F1 score. Do you also have numbers for that are broken down for true positive rate and false positive rate? Yeah, we 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 don't calculate the. Positive rate and the and the another rate. We just calculate the everyone score on each model. Okay, so that that's all. Thanks. Okay, you can stop sharing the screen. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, right now, we would like to start the award ceremony. We have to announce the winners uh, for the AI for Fusion Energy Challenge. Now, I would like to share my screen. the winners for the uh, Energy Challenge. Two and for the owner of missions, uh, unfortunately there is no prize, but we would like to honor you for your hard work and dedication to this competition. So the first owner of mission is Top Island, and the second one is Dioko Foyu. And on the third place, uh, I would like to announce the third winner for this competition. And the third one is Team Rodian. Congratulations. Uh, for the second for the run up, we have Newbie, who is the run up. And third place will get $1,000. The second uh, the run up will get uh, $1,500. And the first team is the winner for this competition and will receive 2,500 US dollars. And the winner is Isaac Holwafem OG. Unfortunately, we had some technical issues. We couldn't get uh, Isaac to this webinar, but he's the overall winner of this competition. So congratulations to everyone. And thank you for your hard work. I would like to ask Shengwe for just a few remarks before we close uh, the webinar. So Shengwe, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I uh, I have a slide, but uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, let me do it. OK. So, so for closing, I would just like to say thank you. Uh, I, give, uh, I would like to give thanks to everyone. First, I want to thanks to give thanks to all the participants, and for for bringing inspirations and new perspectives to this uh, distortion uh, prediction problems. And I also want to give thanks to to all my colleagues who helped in this competition, uh, like Zhong Yuyang, Chen Shuo, Feng Min, and uh, many my students. Also, I want to give thanks to Christina, Thomas, and Matteo, and Deca, and uh, Jinxiang. Uh, they 
they helped a lot. Uh, they helped uh, organizing this event and they helped bringing attention to fusion and uh, disruption predictions. Before that, uh, probably nobody knows, uh, at least uh, outside the fusion com community, nobody knows what is disruption prediction. Okay, for the future, for Outlook's uh, fusion still uh, needs AI and like all kinds of scientific problems, uh, AI is uh, is needed by all of them. Uh, and in the future, maybe uh, there would be more challenge about uh, fusion energy. Maybe for the inertial fusion energy machine learning challenge, maybe that would be one. And uh, it's very hot for uh, in fusion community that the AI powered plasma control is, is a hot topic. And also AI enhanced the simula uh, simulation in fusion is also a uh, uh, very hot topic. Uh, for disruption prediction, uh, this this uh, challenge I think it is very well organized, and a lot of participants has offered a lot of ideas. And but there are some drawbacks, uh, mostly from our side. The the data is not a uh, very very good, and the, the both the quality and the, the the quantity, especially the quantity, is not not that large. So maybe in the future we can we can have more disruption prediction challenges with better data and uh, better uh, better data. And uh, last, uh, to my surprise, uh, uh, there are a few few teams that uh, has. Uh, fusion background in in the finalist, and uh, uh, I'm very ha happy to to see that. And uh, but the the most important thing is that the the non fusion community gets to know what the fusion data is, what the fusion data what the fusion data looks like, and they can they they got their hands on it. And maybe in the future, more more people from outside the fusion world would. Would be interested in uh, using fusion data to do some uh, machine learning works and help us to solve a lot of questions, problems. Okay, thank you. I think I have finished my closing. Thank you. Just... Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and thanks to everyone. Congratulations to the teams that have uh, won and uh, you did a good job uh, in participating in our competition. I would like to once again thank all the partners who were there with us, and I hope we can continue from this momentum next year. And I wish you to have a good day, everyone. This is the end of our session. Bye. <clears throat>